All right, cool. Yeah. So you're saying, Eddie? So I just, I just love like how, you know, how with um, classical literature, you know, a, a lot of the stories that I love, um, it's not like a typical, what you would consider like a narrative plot where the story advances quite quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the hero has this problem. He goes out and solves this problem. Mm -hmm. He meets this other person, et cetera. Whereas with literature, there's, there, there, there are bouts in the storyline where like for like several hundred pages where, where you're just off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah, literally. Um, yeah, exactly. You're off on a tangent, but each scene has, has a certain lesson that can be extracted if you just sort of like slow down and read it. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't necessarily move the, the plot of the story forward. Does that make sense? It's just yeah. kind of like, Here's a thought. Let's explore this thought. Yeah, it's um, um, if I think about it, it, that's the purpose, you know. Uh, that yeah. whole platitude. It's about the journey. Uh -huh. Those segues. You can imagine it going through the forest, but getting yeah. distracted by this little bushy pathway. You know, you were supposed to go mm -hmm. to the end of the forest to get to the next village. You know, the next mission. Yeah. But then you see a nice, pretty flower, some shit, and then you yeah. See how a flower is a metaphor for a woman or some dumb shit. And then you yeah. just harp on that like for two to ten pages or some shit. That's why that's why um you know the best way to read literature and, and novels is to mm -hmm. obviously you need a lot of time. Yeah. And you need like no distractions because it, it really is a ritual yeah. of like, you know, not just yeah. absorbing it's, the story, but also thinking about the concepts that, that yes. the author wants you to think about. Yeah, it's uh, definitely mm -hmm. um, like a deep work session. It's something mm. that you take the time for. It's like uh, playing uh, chess or uh, go or uh, painting. You cannot rush a painting. And in mm -hmm. that sense, literature equates more to art for me in the sense yep. that it's not that it's better or worse. It's different. And you have to approach it very differently. And yeah. for people who want to get into literature reading, I, well, recently I finished Norwegian Wood by uh, Murakami. We can talk a little bit about that. Mm, but, we should do uh, that another time. Yeah. Yeah. We can, <laughs> we can talk about that another time. But um, so what I, what I do, what I tend to do, it's a little bit like a, how do you call it? A reflex. Once mm -hmm. you get to know a new author, you just go yeah. on Wikipedia and read a little bit about the author. So you know yeah. what kind of teams he works, what kind of teams he works with. What kind of stuff yeah. he has, and then you don't get confused. For example, Murakami uh, is set with magic realism. For those unindicted, mm. it's uh, where fantastical elements, very like uh, Carl Gustav Jung, like Jungian would have with these um, archetypical signs, would come mm -hmm. in our physical reality. And it could be very spacey, very floaty. And I didn't see it in uh, Norwegian wood, but in a short uh, story collections, there's just a fucking talking monkey, for example. That's a yeah. fantastical element that if, mm -hmm. if you don't know who Murakami is or you just pick it up randomly and that's not your cup of tea, then you should have, you know, researched a little bit, give the author a chance and yeah. on and on with each author. Like um, Hemingway doesn't like to use metaphors that much, but if he does, no. it's, it is there. Uh, yep. And uh, what's his name? Fitzgerald approaches it again very differently also with teams and motifs and yep. yeah on and on and on so do, do don't uh, get discouraged approach it from a very yeah a very studious point of view truth be told you know and give it the effort yeah are you one of those guys where you read a particular author i know your your love and obsession with lee child but like yeah. like when you read an author do you tend to like read every other <laughs> do you tend to read every other work by that author or do you jump around a lot mm, it depends if i like him so uh um, yeah because with murakami for me it was like an obsession mm -hmm. like i read norwegian wood and i read but that i mean that was a bit of an exception because my brother had all, like a massive collection and he lived in japan as well and so i read norwegian wood dance 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 kafka mm -hmm. on the shore Mm -hmm. uh, hard boiled at Wonderland and End of the World. Yeah. Like pretty much in sequence. Yeah. Um, and a few others I read, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember just being like obsessed with his style, that dreamlike state. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. You're yeah always yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's he cool. has that magic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's I a would weird say feeling. If, 
I would say if the author catches my respect. What I mean by that is, um, yeah. like a magic trick, it's mm. a flourish kind of. And if you like it, you want more of the trick because only he can give you that juice. Only he can give you that special voice that he has or a sauce. And for example, with Ernest Hemingway, uh, to talk about one of my other favorite writers, I haven't read yep. him, by the way, in a long time. I might try to complete his oeuvre, his, his whole work, because I was uh, addicted after I bought his first novel. It's called um, The Sun Also Rises or Fiesta in some countries. And I just got hooked on his specific style. It was a little bit clunky, they had said about his first mm. novel. And uh, legend goes, his parents even didn't like it or something like that. But um, I got hooked on it. So I went down the rabbit hole until I found my personal favorite, which is, yeah. um, what's his name? Farewell to Arms. That's my favorite mm. one for okay. uh, the characters. Because right. the, boy, the boy and the girl are so lifelike. You can tell that mm. it's very autobiographical written that it must have been based on one of his lovers or his wife or something like that. Yeah. The way they yeah. speak with each other, it's so, it's so good. It cannot be, yeah. you know? And, yeah, uh, I mean, Hemingway is like, he's, he's just a classic writer. He's like a man's writer. You know, he literally just, this guy just literally just lived a really adventurous life and, and wrote stories based on his experiences. Yeah, that's pretty dope. But uh, so That's it's pretty much what he did. Yeah, it's only if you capture my respect, kind of, and then you go down the rabbit hole because you know, yep. only only read stuff. You know, for people who want some actionable advice, only read stuff that you really care about. Don't yeah. Don't listen to what the fuck me and Eddie are saying or somebody else. If yeah. you think this is cool, if you think something is cool, just pick it up, give it a chance, and just read it. Don't yeah. give a fuck whatever anybody says. Yeah, I love yeah. it. That's that. That's yeah. the best reading advice we can give you. Yeah. So, so smooth transition today yes. on the. Eddie Fury podcast. We're going to talk yeah. about uh, Final Spin, the yes. first fiction novel by none other than Jocko Willink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be good. So, but uh, I, love uh, it. Um, I think last year in 2021, so damn, time flies, it's uh, me and Eddie had heard about that Jocko was putting this out. Mm -hmm. And I think I saw it in one of his tweets and I just clicked on it and I went to like a, a pre sale page on Amazon. And I saw final spin. I was like, it's going to be something hardcore, you know, like difficult job. Yeah. But it just said a fiction novel by Jocko Willink. And it actually got me really intrigued. Uh, so mm. what got you, you know, what got you going? What got your energies flowing when you heard about this? Like, Okay, so just to like preface this entire conversation, sure. I, I will just outright just say I'm a massive like simp for Jocko Willink. <laughs> Um, I discovered Jocko. I just listened to the very first episode on, on his podcast. I listened yeah, to yes, him on, before he had a, before he had a podcast. Yeah. So I've same always respected well. him as, as exactly. I've always respected him as a man. Yeah. But I always knew that he had some serious writing chops because mm -hmm. he studied the classics in yes. America, like yeah. he studied literature, and he's a massive uh, Shakespeare fan. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So he's really like he. This guy knows his literature. He he, he might come off as a bit of a knucklehead because yeah. like of the whole you know discipline and like you know um, and Navy used to thing to hardcore metal and shit, you know, and all that sort of shit. But he's really he. I can tell he's he's the guy's he's a smart man and he read he reads very widely. Yeah, and there's a couple of episodes where he recites Henry V. Yeah, 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 and like he does a really good job of it. And so I I've always felt that he's had this fascination with literature he, he actually says he's not a massive fiction reader which i i think he's kind of lying he said one of his favorite books though is um, blood meridian which yeah, happens yeah, yeah. to be my favorite novel of all time yeah. we're, go we're gonna discuss so that immediately one. I, I was immediately one. i yeah <laughs> immediately i had this like connection with jocko i'm like yeah this guy gets it yeah uh, truth be told so uh, when he said be, he was yeah gonna be honest uh, he i said, read i read blood meridian for him actually because of him but yeah go on what oh you? nice yeah. Well, I was just about to say, so when he said he put out a novel, I was just as surprised as you were. I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And my expectations were low because I was just like, well, you know, it's his first novel. Huh? Um, you know, he's, you know, he's, despite what I, I think about him in terms of literature, 
you know, he's, yeah. you know, he's yeah. just so busy and he's, yeah. he's written all these books and he's like this guru. Like how <laughs> good can this, how good can this novel really be? Yeah. Right. And also, oh, not only that theory, but like, I was aware of my bias. So I was like, I am a fanboy. So like, I have to adjust my, fa- my, my, my expectations for my fanboyism. <laughs> If that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It makes it's, like, it's like reading a novel by your dad. It's like, I'm going to like this no matter what because he's my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm going to lower the expectations. <laughs> and before we dive into the story and what's about all this stuff, I will just say, I thought it was a good book. I don't think it's a classic, like it's an amazing book. But yeah. I, it was, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I thought it left me with a feeling, it's a very wholesome story. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know, we're, we're probably not, we, we shouldn't ruin the plot, right? Like, we'll yeah. just try not to talk about the plot. Yeah. So, what you, um, uh, so, disclaimer, like, we won't give, like, we'll try to, um, you know, spoiler warning if, like, by accident something yeah. slips out. But we'll try yeah. to evade the most big plot points and just talk about a little bit yeah. uh, the teams, narrative, plot devices, yeah. and uh, to talk yeah. about storytelling, what we're here for, you know, that people don't talk about. Yeah. And I, uh, quick, so I have a fuck ton of things to say, actually, so... A quick segue <laughs> or tying up to that like preface what you said you know um the reason the reason why i read blood meridian was because of jocko willing he's been influential yeah. on me for my reading choices but uh-huh. oh actually uh, for people who are watching this right now or who know who actually actually eddie to go even deeper the reason why you and i know each other is because of jocko actually yeah because uh, uh, before he had his own podcast, he was on the Tim Ferriss podcast, right? Like you said. Yes. I watched that one as well. I, I just got into Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss has beautiful podcasts. It's full of wisdom every minute, you know? And then I saw this hardcore Navy SEAL. He can choke you out, blah, blah. I was like, fuck, I need to check out this guy, you know? And back then there was this social media app called Twitter. I was like, what is Twitter, you know? And I make an account just for Jocko. He's the only person that I follow. And my password is something like Jocko Willink or something. It's not my password anymore. If somebody was to hack me, it's not, it's not my password anymore. But, and so he's the reason why um, I got, uh, gotten down this journey and why I met people like Eddie money, Twitter, and why I'm doing this now. Wow. (laughs) Love it. I fucking love it, man. So how does it, I have to put him like down a notch as well, not to pedestalize him and stuff like that, but it it just got me curious, man. So it's, I just wanted to hear what he was going to do because uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. I have, li- uh, I have listened to the audible version of Final Spin and Eddie has only read the Kindle, right? So yeah, Eddie has seen it from a visual point of view and I've approached it from an auditorial point of view. That's going to give a nice dichotomy, you know, layers. Uh, Jocko loves to say the word dichotomy. And that's going to give it a nice like little tension between me and Eddie when we go back and forth. But I just wanted something new, you know, and it's, uh, in his bonus conversation, he actually says uh, a lot of things that, um, like, for example, Jocko Willink, his mother uh, used to be an English teacher or something like that. That's said on, the, oh. that's said on the podcast, by the way, not on the bonus conversation. But in the bonus conversation, he talks about how he's a well-rounded human being. He loves playing guitar. Uh, he's not good yeah. at it. He, he loves music. For example, what's this, uh, one of his favorite bands, White Buffalo? I don't know, for the Americans out there, uh, I like White Buffalo as well. But you wouldn't expect that from, a, from, from face value. Look at Jocko. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know? But that, and he th- surfs and he plays. Yeah, he, yeah exactly. and lots of shit. Yeah. So that's what made me intrigued. I wanted to see yeah. a slice of Jocko in the, well, in this case, the, 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 the listening book format. And just want to see what it was all about, you know? And it delivered, in my honest opinion, as well. I'm not, yeah. like, big on reviews, per se, or something. But it was a, a thumping read that I got. I yeah. just got hooked for a couple of days, and it was enjoyable. And I will yeah. never forget a book that I finished, you know, including this one. And it was good. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very short book. Mm-hmm. Um, you can probably pump it out in a couple of re- so I, I read it in, like, three or four sittings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me. And yeah, I, I would say the word is wholesome, mm-hmm. just purely because of, of the main character, Artie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's dive um, into Artie straight away. Yeah. Well, let's just give a brief overview. So the, the story it's about this guy, his name is Johnny. Yeah. Um, he's a he's a bit of a loser. He he works like at this 
supermarket, like as the, as the guy stacking the boxes with his friend, mm -hmm. Goat. <laughs> and his mom's an alcohol. That's not an interesting thing. Oh, we want to dive into the mom that she's not in there, but his mom is a um, alcoholic. Um, and he's got this brother who's mentally ill. His name's Artie. And Artie works at a laundromat. Um, and we can't really, I can't really say much more than that. The, the, something, something crazy happens and, and, and um, yeah. him and Go get involved in some bad shit. I would say um, for, mm, I would say a little bit like literary buffs, it yep. slightly ties to, so it's not a, I wouldn't say it's like a literature book, but if it tries to shoot for literature, it's this, um, there's this phrase or concept, it's called uh, 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 Roman de Clef. What it means, actually, it's in French, it means um, a novel or uh, a Roman means novel that's close to the heart. And usually those novels are hero's journeys and not to give any spoilers away. And there's this German term called Bildungsroman. It means, building means to build up and it's a hero's journey kind of as well for the arc right. that, so I wouldn't say Artie goes through an arc I would say if he's a foil for Johnny or Johnny is a foil for Artie, because of the arc that Johnny goes through, Artie gets developed as well. And so what Eddie has hinted that something crazy happens and pushes Johnny forward from loser status to redeem himself, to yeah. make something yeah. of his life. And uh -huh. that's where it becomes wholesome and digs into your uh, heartstrings and pulls it and fleshes out those yeah. uh, archetypical uh, expressions that we have all inside of us. Yeah. I think one good thing right off the bat that, that I think that, and this is probably like the biggest strength of this novel, mm -hmm. is all the care, and he says this, like Jocko, the characters are composites, are perfect composites of people that you and I can relate to. Yeah. Like everyone knows an Adi, everyone knows a goat, everyone knows a Johnny. Did he say that? Was it in a preface or something? No, no. So he he has a podcast where he talks about the book without spoiling it with yeah. with um, Echo. Oh, yeah, he talks about how he wrote the book and how he wrote the characters. Yeah. Um. So uh, I checked out. So for those people who want to give this a shot, do check out uh, the written format of the book because it has a unique visual format. How the words are laid out. And, but do check yes. out the Audible for the one hour, one plus hour bonus conversation that he has. Almost throws in a fucking podcast at the end of the book. <laughs> I was so, I was oh, so man. fucking happy. And, I need to listen to that podcast. Um, uh, he says, um, so, oh, well, uh, this is a little bit spoiler if for people are going to check this out. But, um, he said that the editor or his agent said to him, you know, Jocko, your characters could use a little bit more development, you know? That's for, um, mm. you know, critique, critique. And then he said, let me gonna be honest with you. We already know these characters, he said to her. We already know what's mm. going through Artie's head. And I don't need to flesh it out what they're gonna say, or I don't need to expand upon it. We know Johnny, we know Jessica, we know Goat. We know everyone, yeah. they're so archetypical. He didn't use that word, so, but you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah. they're housed in our, in our subconscious, you know, in our collective yeah. unconscious. To, to phrase yeah. another Jung term. Yeah. yeah, that's I think that's what makes this book such a e such a such an easy book to digest. Yeah. Um because because those characters like it's kind of like I I felt like I was going back in the time machine and like hanging out with like because these characters I think they're in, they're only in early 20s and the, they're the type of people you do meet around that age. Mm -hmm. So so for me, like when I when I was reading, it was like I, I it like it kind of immediately took me back to that period of my life, and I can think of at least two people that are very similar to like Johnny and Jessica at least, yeah, and Go, yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, the but format I... was, was that's probably the biggest surprise that you mentioned, like the, the mm -hmm. actual physical formatting of how the book is written. Mm -hmm. It's very strange, but it kind of it does help advance the story. Yeah, and I don't know if he talks about why he he wrote it that way. Is that yeah. why he wrote it that way? Uh, yeah. So uh, diving into the bonus material again, uh, I made some notes here. Um, so he doesn't have a word for it. Here is um, a, a, a small segue that comes in my mind. 
when you do POA or game, there are these uh, tactical guys who use all the tricks, but there are also these natural guys, these natural funny guys, charming, who get all the girls, right? I would say to, to make a tangent, Jocko is a natural type of writer because um, he doesn't know why he did it, actually. He doesn't mm. have a name for it. He would say uh, it might be some kind of poetry technique or something, but I just mm. put it in this book. I don't know why. And then uh, again, his, his editor or his agent said, yo, that, that word's a little bit funny. Why did you put it there? And then Jaco said, well, I just put where the word belongs. <laughs> the word is supposed to go there. Bro, and I was like, that's how you flex. That's how you I, flex without, I, looking, without, without being arrogant about it. Yeah, and, and it was yeah, like, I'm just, I'm basically, I'm a genius. And <laughs> I figured it out naturally. Yeah, and I was like, that's, <laughs> that's what cool. he's saying. Yeah, no, but this, this made me like Jaco more. So um, we can make a small tangent here. In the sense, uh, for those who read Blood Meridian, the reason also why I like that book is because uh, Cormac McCarthy throws, gives a big fat ass middle finger to writing concepts and writing <laughs> rules and uh, stigma and stuff like that. So for those uh, budding writers, have you ever heard about dialogue tags? So it's yeah. he said, dialogue tag open, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then Eddie said, blah, blah, blah. He throws all the fucking dialogue tags out of the fucking yeah. book and just smears this fucking blob of ink in your face. Yeah. And uh, he has sentences that span a fucking page. And when I yeah. saw that, the, uh, to, to make a tie to Shakespeare, since we talked about Shakespeare as well, he has this quote that I always love to quote, there's no desire as common as a desire to be uncommon. When I saw that, I saw somebody that was authentic, didn't give a fuck and wrote however the fuck he want. And yeah, now Jocko Willing was doing that as well. I cannot not yeah. take inspiration from that shit. When I saw that shit, I yeah. was like, yo, I'm going to just start fucking throwing words here and there. Like, I don't give a fuck, you know? Yeah, yeah. One thing I love about this book theory is that I think I mentioned it to you when I was half, because you and I were, were texting back and forth half when I, as I was reading it, yeah, yeah. is it's very, very cinematic. And what I mean by that is a lot of novels, like you can't, I don't know how to explain it. You're not, it do, you don't really see the scene of the book mm -hmm. as much as like think about the concepts that the story is telling you about. Mm -hmm. Like you sort of just feel it, if that makes sense. Whereas with this book, every scene you can like, you can visualize it. Um, and so yeah. that's what I mean by it. it's a very, very cinematic book. And that's why it's such an easy book to read. Mm, so um, I, I can make a segue again uh, from uh, the bonus material. There, mm -hmm. there, so I, he didn't say that he made it cinematic. Again, it was maybe a side effect or uh, not on purpose, but off, pur I don't know what off purpose, but um, there was a phrase that I think Dave Burke for the podcast, Jocko podcast fans interviews him. And he says, um, there's a scene where something happens and it just says on the page, Artie tilts his head. And Dave Burke asked him, Again, uh, your editor said you, your characters could, you know, use more development, but you just write Artie tilts his head. You don't write Artie is feeling distraught, blah, 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 doesn't know what to do. You know, you could give more words and fill up the page, but instead Jocko favors this uh, short, concise military style, not explaining everything and anything about how Artie came in that headspace and that emotion. And... Dave asked him, you know, uh, is this on purpose or is this a hard sentence for you to write? And he said, it's, it's not easy to write these kind of sentences, but it's, it came natural to him. And then he made um, an analogy, again, why I love Jocko after this bonus conversation. He said, uh, I like music. And for those music mm. fans, he says, musicians utilize space, silence. And to mm. quote one of my most famous uh, Josh Waitzkin chess player quotes, or it was maybe Miles Davis, he says, music is in the silence between the notes. Right. And that's super profound. But somehow Jaco tapped into that knowledge by putting wow. silence on the page. So when you yeah. put silence on the page, you give silence to the reader. And that makes you fill it up, I think, with, for example, in your uh, imagination, with a cinematic flair. And, and maybe in somebody else's head, it would give space for some kind of other musicality, you know? So that's, that's dope. Wow, that, that actually clears up a lot. I never thought about it, but that makes complete sense. 
So like he's, as he's writing this, he's thinking about the rhythm of the novel. Yeah. Right. And that's what he's talking about, the, the space. And, and that allows you, and, and that creates the tension. Yes. Um, that you feel throughout the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, bro, that's fucking awesome. I, I never thought about it that way, but that, now that you explain, that makes sense. That's fucking awesome as well. Um, for, well, to, to toot my horn a little bit, uh, for people who say I have a certain writing style as well, if you want to get something, um, how do you say, vi if you want a certain vitality, uh, a living quality to your writing, you have to give it lyricality, this musical quality, musicality. Yeah. And that's what I try to do. That, I, yeah. that is something that's really hard to master. Yeah. It's like really, really hard to do. Like yeah. rhythm, lyric, yeah. What, what was the word? Lyricality? <laughs> yeah, that's the word I like to use, yeah. I love it. I love yeah. it. Oh, can we pause it right there? I'll be right back. And yeah. grab my and he's going to pause, guys, but you won't notice the thing because I pause and we'll be right back. So, yeah, so we're talking about like the musical quality about writing. Yeah. Mm, mm -hmm. How do I say this? So we've talked a little bit how natural Jocko writes, you know? <laughs> And yeah, I quote yeah, yeah. here, and I quote here from the bonus conversation again. He just writes like he brushes his teeth. He doesn't label himself as a writer. It's just part of you. What's your take on that? Because we've discussed this, um, you know, off the timeline, in between the DMs, and I don't like to call myself a, a writer. But how do you see this? Like, uh, yeah, bro, it reminds me of this old Christopher Hitchens quote, which is, uh, "Being a writer is not what I do; it's what I am." Um, and I think Jocko, I agree, he's just a natural, he, he's a natural leader. And to be a good leader, you have to be a good communicator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, to be, and to be a good communicator, you have to be a good writer. So I would argue writing is a, subs is a subset of his skill, mm. which is, of his natural skill, which is he's a natural leader. That's probably a more accurate way to describe Jocko. Um, and yeah, as, as part of being a good leader is you have to learn how to write. Um, and that's just it, really. That's true. Uh, he always talks um, about clear and concise. Clear and concise mm. communication. I like those two words yeah. back to back by him. Uh, it's it's a, for those <laughs> fans, it's an alliteration. CCC, clear and concise communication. It just, see, again, Love it. Uh, he does these little stylistic flourishes just by accident, kind of, even when he speaks. You know, so that's just the thing, how natural he is. And I think, yeah, he, he had found out that he wanted to be a leader. N not that he wanted to be a leader, but he, he has, so for fans of the Jocko podcast, he has talked about his detachment origin story on that oil rig platform training platform for those, you know, if we want to talk about it. So he was on the platform and um, they had to make a move or something and everybody kind of froze. And he looked around, you know, he always says, relax, be calm, look around, make a call, yeah. you know, take a step back. Yeah. And it was in that yeah. moment, his origin story where he was like, no, I'm the only one that's detached. <laughs> and when yeah. you detach, you're a natural born leader, you know? Yeah. And uh, maybe he had found out that as a leader, you need one of the communication styles. That's either um, the, uh, the oratory style, like uh, Cicero, you know, and those big um, old traditional Homerus kind of, you know, big storytellers. Or you yeah. need to uh, master the verbal format or something of that kind, you know? And yeah, he, he, he's pretty good in lots of things. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, how did you feel listening to the book? Listening? What, uh, what do you mean feel? <laughs> in what sense? I mean, mm -hmm. I've never heard all your, I've only ever heard, I think, one audio book in my life. Really? You don't, you, what, you don't, yeah. You're not an audio book guy? I'm not an audio book guy. Okay. I'll tell you why. I, um, Yeah, it's just the, 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 for me, I'm a slow reader in general. And so an audio book for me, it, it's very hard for me to get into it because it just, it's, it just moves too fast. Mm -hmm. So I've never really, uh, yeah, I've li like the only, the only audio book I've completed is um, Green Lights by McCon Matthew mm. McConaughey, which is a great book as well. Really good one. We should uh, review that one as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should. That's great. That's a great book to read or listen to if you want to 
learn how to tell stories because he's a fucking fen- he's a phenomenal storyteller. He's Matthew a fucking McConaughey. genius. Just, just go yeah. to for for fans of Matthew McConaughey right now or people that got buzzed by this. Just go to the Amazon, um, you know, the blurb and just read that summary. When you read that summary, you want to fucking buy that book. Yeah. Make copies and just give it to people. That's yeah. got, that got me hooked. There's like a fucking yeah. legendary wrestling match, a walkabout. He takes peyote. Yeah. It, it's fucking cool. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, no, okay, but know, to, yeah, to, to answer your question. Go, but, but, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go, tell me about your audiobook experience mm. with, with this novel. I have been into audiobooks a little bit longer, personally. So it was a novel for me. It was my first Jocko Willink audiobook. So um, a slight, how do I say this, hidden motive, motive uh, behind consuming this book and discussing it is because I wanted to hear Jocko voice narrate a story. Uh, it's just one of these little things that I like in life, you know. And how do I say this? So my experience on that is that for me, I'm a fast reader, actually in the sense that yeah. I read a little bit too fast. And when I switch to a different, um, how do I say this? So when you take an in information, it could be through the eyes, that sight, or it could be through the, through the hearing sense. And actually when yeah. it goes to the sense that is not my dominant one, it goes slower. And I have this, um, you know, like train everything. I like to train everything a little bit. And when I listen, it actually goes slower. I don't know how to explain this, but- Interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a tangent for another time maybe, but um so when Jocko uh, narrates actually he has a very mm, succinct declarative way of telling things that especially his military writing style lends towards to so there especially so not spoiling again there's a little bit action as the book goes to the climax very action packed and you could tell that he was in the military by the way he was like uh, door opens gun guy this yeah. Uh, and yeah yeah and that was perfect in my honest opinion perfect for a military commander to read that out loud i was like yeah. oh yeah we got like a kind of fan service. <laughs> and it was a little bit like a fan and so it was like almost how do i say this like he's reading a military debrief you know what i mean like two yeah guys, two guys step out the car you know this that uh, headlight off you know and i was like shit that's cool so that was my experience on that um, I just like listening to his gruff voice. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't like guys who have a very uh, nasal tone, so they haven't overcome nasality and um, like a high pitched squeaky voice. But sure. I like Jocko's voice. You know, uh, there's no yeah way. because he's an alpha. You know, he has that good, good. You know, good, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He's he's he's, he's a great communicator. So like, I would say, really like the fans of the Jocko podcast, it adds. You know, it adds. So if you you if you're gonna check this book out, just check out both. You know, just buy the fucking book and the audiobook. It's you know, it's good for your education. It's dirt cheap. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me think. Mm, I haven't written anything down as to that experience more so, but um, okay. I would say that. Um, it flowed really well. So like I said, it makes me want to slow down, but it, it got me into it. That made me check that book out only, you know, uh, in a sequence like days and days and days and end until completion. And th- that just lends to the quality of the story coupled with the narration, you know? So no knock on it. It just flowed um, yeah. quite well, quite well. It's good. Did you notice, uh, I don't know how it came up in the audio book, but there's certain scenes where it's whatever whatever it's going on in the scenes quite a serious part of the story but it's quite comedic as well there's parts of the book where i just like was like i was like i'm laughing and i, I can tell that he, he he's written it in a way that makes it that's supposed to be funny but not like ha 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 like pure comedy funny yeah just just the way it happens is is quite funny yeah maybe I, uh, I haven't, to be honest, I'm not a funny person. So sometimes I have this thing that I miss humor, you know? Oh, uh, right. <laughs> of, uh, the Big Bang Theory, like Sheldon Cooper doesn't understand sarcasm or some shit, you know? Or right. uh, uh, I, I sometimes miss those kind of things. But w- was there a specific scene that you can talk a little bit about or without giving too much away? The first gunshot, the first gunshot, like yeah. they're, they're just, that 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 scene's like it's yeah. funny man like i don't know it's, it, because this is ridiculous uh, and, the, and the way it happens i think i think um so 
I tend to conceptualize things a little bit differently in my brain. Yeah. I was in like, cafeteria, you're you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought this yeah. was, uh, no, I thought it was like, I would almost say redonkulous. Like, yo, this is fucking ridiculous, you know? Um, and to, to use, all, again, like, yeah. we're talking a little That's bit. That's what I mean. I think to think, to talk a little bit about literature, I think this is almost the concept of absurd, you know? Like, um, going closer to the absurd. Like, mm. yo, this, this is absurd, man. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You said he did that on purpose, you think, to make it that ridiculous? Well, I think so. Like a scene like that, mm -hmm. if it were if it were in a Hollywood movie, it would play out differently. Mm -hmm. Whereas the way he wrote it, it's, it, it seems very realistic. But also, the reactions of the people are quite funny because it's so real. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, something just popped in my head from. Um... I think it's George R. R. Martin. So the creator of um, Game of Thrones, the book series. Yeah. Um, they once asked him, "How do you write um, dialogue and interaction?" You know, to to right. make a, a, a tangent to this, and he says, <clears throat> "You just create an organic living character. Let's say uh, Khaleesi or Jon Snow, the big, you know, the mm. OGs." And what you do, you just uh, put them in a scene, you know, they're in the castle or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. because they're so fucking real, uh, John is going to say X, John is going to do X, and Khaleesi is going to do X and X, Y, Z. Right. You know? right. There's no other way that she's going to do that other thing, right? So making, mm, making a point for powerful story construction and make it uh, making the focal point characters around the story uh, around which the story is mm -hmm. created if you just create again like we said we know characters like johnny and goat i think who are in this scene you know and if you just make him like real characters living human beings almost put them on the page and put them in a scene where something's going to happen uh, like you know roughly what is about to happen just just yeah. act in their natural way yeah, which something happens that maybe Jocko didn't plan from like, let's say uh, when he opened that chapter, you know, he, he's in his typewriter or whatever in his Google Docs mm. and it just explodes and combusts and gets ridiculous like that. And he would even look on the page. Yo, I didn't expect that, but it works. It flows and it's very organic mm. and natural and true, true to the characters, uh, how he had positioned them to use yeah. another. Well, this is full of Jocko layers. To use another word like he loves to use in his podcast, um, characters in a scene are decisively engaged. Like in the military, once you're in combat, you're decisively engaged and you go for the, the fruition or the climax of the battle. And in this case, the battle is two, two characters in a scene. Interesting. Yeah, it reminds me of, so uh, for those who, who really want to learn like the art of writing and so forth, especially when it comes to fiction. Yeah. The Paris Review, which is a literary magazine. Is it still ongoing? I think so. I'm just about to Google now. It <laughs> has like a bunch of like, so the Paris Review. It, it has a lot of really good interviews with like yeah. classic I authors. Anyway. I've seen a couple. So I'm not big on that, but I think I saw Tim Ferriss quoted once or, you know, <clears throat> oh, interesting. Anyway, so they did one on an author who I love called Norman Mailer. I don't know. Um, Norman Mailer is like an old school American author. Uh, he wrote one of my favorite novels ever. It's called The Naked and the Dead, which is about a troop of American soldiers who are trying to take this fort in Japan. And um, mm -hmm. long ass fucking interview. But it mm -hmm. goes back to what you were saying about how like, putting characters in a room and then just letting them naturally interact. The way he did it, man, and this is epic, he would have a manila folder for each character, key character of the novel. Yes. And he would write a biography for each character. Yeah. Um, and so, so like, if, he's writing, if he's writing a scene, he doesn't know how these characters should react. He's, he would pull out his manila folders and like read their bio as if it was a real person. Um, I used to be part of a, of a writing group, and they were kind of geeky and into fantasy and fantasy books. And it's, right. I don't know a Norma Manila, uh, Norma Mele, uh, but it's among fantasy writers that you build character sheets and they do it as well. They have these stacks on stacks on Thank stacks you. where they first yeah. write the fucking character sheets before they write the story. And I was like, yo, that's some dorky ass shit, but it sounds cool. Don't get me wrong. And now that I think about it, it's yeah. cool. 
because yeah it's dorky and it's epic <laughs> it, it's epic uh, because now to make this even more dorkier so i used to watch anime and there was <clears throat> there was a, a series called one piece it's one of the most famous anime besides naruto and bleach not going to go too deep in mm. that but amongst the the manga writers you know uh one piece was the most famous because it was so dense with all the fucking character background and the stories were huge. And what, what's so fucking cool about it, I can never start to talk, stop talking too much about this. He has an arc that is so huge always. And you just want to go to the fucking end, but we've talked about making these detours, right? And so there's something called like the, the fucking Elephant Island arc or something, you know? I, I'm, I'm out of it, but he put a screenshot on his Twitter or his social media or whatever, and then you see this fat book, that's the fucking arc. And then to, to, to how do you say, like almost cock tease the reader, you see these like fucking notebooks, like stacked upon stack of the other arcs that are going to come. And people are like, whoa, shit. Yeah. Fantasy is a different genre like that, though, because they're, they're, um, their stories and the characters are like really, really well developed. That, 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 that's, that's where the geekiness and the dorkiness that you talk about comes from because they've, they've like just gone full autistic and thought about this way too much, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. But anyway, um, that, that is a, uh, probably like a, a, a great way to write dialogue, right? That, that, that's probably yeah. how you get really good dialogue when yeah, you yeah. just go, right, you know, this guy's like this, this, this person's like that. You know, they're in the room, they're having a conversation about this topic. Like, how's it going to come? How would it come yeah. out naturally? So, truth be told, uh, it's a little, um, a little quirk or a little hack that I like to use. When I were to write a fiction book, I don't write fiction that often anymore, but I make one of the characters into one of my friends. And it's almost right. impossible not to know what the person is going to say. And yeah. because I just know how they're going to say the word, I even know where the commas and the periods go. And I, I can make a little, like, I don't know if Eddie remembers that, but I was going to write a certain thriller novel where yeah. I take every, everybody like Eddie and put him on the page. And I asked Eddie, you know, what kind of character do you want? What kind of weapon do you want? And those kind of stuff. Yeah, I and remember that. Yeah. I, I, I think I still have those notes somewhere. So if I were to write a character like Eddie, there, he's going to look, he's going to talk a little bit like Eddie, but in a more, how do I say, action hero kind of vibe, you know? Nice. Yeah. So it's just a little trick oh, that, that Jocko used as well, because he said, you said, you can imagine that Jessica and Goat and Johnny, you, you know, a couple of people like that, right? In, yeah. in the bonus conversation, he talks about how, especially I think Johnny, I think Johnny, uh, one of the main characters was based on one of his guys that he used to know in New England before he left there for the military. So yes. long story short, um, that guy, he got into some trouble and I think... He maybe committed yeah. suicide or something. something he like did, that. yeah. And he, he was someone who uh, had a lot of potential but never fulfilled his potential. Yeah. So, that's and the type of character that he wants exactly. to he wrote. Yeah, and that's exactly who Johnny was. Like, he has huge potential yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. And, yeah. So, and I think, I think so, you know, this, this thing that we're doing, this back and forth, is to give back the potency to fiction, right? That's the power of fiction. Mm. It's a slice yeah. of life. It's it's yep. an ends through life if we if we see it like that because these characters come from living human beings. We're reading Johnny, but mm. through reading Johnny, we read this uh, late past friend of uh, Jocko Willink, you know, and that was a real human yeah. being. And it's it's the ultimate homage if we're gonna think about it. Actually, you know, it's the ultimate homage. You know, you know, a lot of people say fiction is like, oh, it's not real, whatever. I actually think it's more real than real. I think it's hyper reality fiction. <laughs> That's how I see it. Can you go a little you bit know, deeper you, you, with that? I, I have a yeah. yeah. You're you're taking. I'll tell you what. It's, it's hyper reality because you're you're taking these characters who are very relatable, who are composites of people who who you know in real life, and I you're putting that. them in you're putting them in situation extreme situations, mm. right? And. The other thing is, and then there's two ways to go about. It. So you have you have stories like that where you you ping, you take an ordinary character, put him in extreme situations with a murder or whatever you want to put in there. Exactly. And then you have the other way, which is the Steinbeck way of like, this is why I love John Steinbeck. You, you take these characters who are very very ordinary, 
and you just put them in like it's like a day in your life and like the story or the narrative isn't anything special there's no like bank robbery or anything like that going on but it sort of like slows down the pace of life and within that within that story you get this like you, you see these little bits of wisdom float up that you wouldn't normally um uh, uh, see when you're living your life because yes. you're just so busy and you're just so caught up in the chaos of yeah. like your routine that you don't have the time to like slow down and like hit pause in a particular moment and, and think about the significance of you know the significance of um eating your dinner for example yeah right most people would sit down it's dinner time you eat your food you wash your dishes yeah and you go, go, go watch go. You, you watch TV, yeah. but you don't really stop there and think, you know what, what, you know, I'm lucky to be able to, sit. this is why I like, you know, like certain religious rituals, like saying grace, because it, saying grace sort of like puts a pause on that and just like show, you know, this meal was actually significant. Mm -hmm. It's actually an important part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so like, that's the beauty of novels. It, it like pauses on those little things that you yeah. never, you normally take for granted. Yeah, and it allows you to sort of hit pause in that and like think about it for a minute. Ah, uh, that's interesting. So regarding that last pausing element, to make a small tie to one uh, to our last podcast, you know, uh, we talked about rituals, the difference between rituals and habits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is that is this what we're talking about again. Exactly. And it reminds yeah. me of um, Norwegian wood of Murakami. We'll talk about it mm. another time, but. How do I say this? So, like you said, that dreamlike quality of his, the mundane, yeah. it makes it sound yeah. special. And I really like yeah. that. There were just, yeah. um, there was a girl, um, there was the girlfriend of another boy, and he didn't want to sleep with her, but he, he saw something in her eyes or something, and he couldn't contextualize and give words to the feeling that he had. And he said he only saw it later, like years later, when he was eating pizza, when the sunset hit him in a certain way or something. And uh, Norwegian Wood? Yeah, in Norwegian Wood. And it was a very yeah. strange paragraph to read, but it was written so special that it was very romantic. Not in a simpy way, but it was so beautiful. And when I sure, read that, sure. uh, there was this personal story that I had as well with a girl and a pizza. But it, wa it yeah. wasn't mm, like that, but it made me think of that, that I had made that special moment, a quote unquote special moment, quote unquote moment in my life. Uh, quote unquote special in that sense as well and that's what we do as writers to give something a sense of heightened yeah heightened reality yeah the, uh, you said it already hyper reality and yeah i tend to do that as well now that i think about it i do it unconsciously though actually i just pause at the things that i think i have to give pause like uh, the other day i was writing a little bit just how i went to buy cigars or something and i just wrote it for myself a little bit but i thought if somebody was going to read this it was such a stylized overinflated fury kind of uh, non-fiction piece if they would read it they would think shit i want to buy cigars as well because it sounds special you know <laughs> and i just you know i was just rambling a little bit with myself on the page as well but there's definitely something to it which you just said to give people some pay uh, some pause pace it properly and in this space and silence uh yeah. the seeds of wisdoms can um can bloom up you know can yeah. Now going back to Final Spin, I will say, and this this isn't really a criticism. It's both, I guess it's both the strength and the weakness. But the, the the dialogue is very very ordinary. Yeah. And when I say ordinary, I mean like it really is how <laughs> so like just regular like normal people speak. There's nothing special in the dialogue, but that's what makes the characters so real and so relatable. Yeah. So it's kind of like a give and take there um like it's not like i don't know it's not like cormac mccarthy where like the dialogue is so rich and so poetic you know yeah, yeah, I mean? yeah 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 where yeah. it's like fuck this guy's this guy the writing blogs is the writing guys has blessed this guy with natural talent yeah and there's I would a certain say, I dialogue would... where it's just like it's just so rich it's not yeah. like that at all yeah it's very very it, it, that's what adds the cinematic effect it's like it's like written by like a movie script almost. Mm. Mm. Definitely, definitely. I think if we're, yeah, if we're going to give some form of critique to this book, it would be that, that, yeah. uh, like you said, he's no second Faulkner. He's no second uh, Hemingway, no, no second um, <laughs> McCarthy, yeah. you know? And yeah, but actually to tie that a little bit back to that Steinbeck theme that you uh, 
um, called a whiff of. Could you explain to the readers a little bit what you, so you think, I think you talked about it pre-recording, but could you zoom in on, yeah. on that? Because uh, he mentioned sure. that I want to go in on the bonus conversation material. Okay, so this is quite funny. So like, I finished the book, like I said, in like three or four sittings. And I just, I, as soon as I finished it, I, I wrote to you and I was like, if I felt like I just read like a St John Steinbeck novel. Yeah. And what I mean by that is I've read, I've read four Steinbeck's books. I've read Grapes of Wrath, Tortilla Flats, Cannery Row. Oh, sorry, three and a half. I'm halfway through uh, East of Eden, which is did a phenomenal read, book. Did as you well. read Steinbeck that um, it's based on the, La the Arthurian story? Uh, keep on talking while I Google that. I don't know. Anyway, so what's beautiful about Steinbeck's writing, specifically Tortilla Flats and Cannery Row, is that, as I was saying earlier in the chat, it's not that you don't remember what the story is about, but it, 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 he writes a lot of, he, he writes these really, really good composite characters that, that, uh, that represent the types of people you're going to encounter in your life, all right? And he does, he writes these characters so well, and he talks about, and the, the characters that he writes are very, very ordinary people, like they're people you meet in your day-to-day -day life, right? Um, and he does it so well that, and the beauty of what he does is he, he takes these ordinary people and somehow in their ordinary lives, he, he manages to like find that moment of redemption for them. Yes, yes. Okay. And that and that's what leaves you that wholesome feeling. It's like this person was so ordinary, he was a complete loser his whole life, but he was able to at least, you know, um, he was able to graduate from, from from university and be the first person to graduate with a degree in his family. And that made his yeah. grandma proud and yes. before she died. Yeah. It's like that sort of story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. it's not Hollywood at all. Hollywood's yeah. like, oh, the guy fucking saves the kills the terrorist, saves the world, and gets yeah. and 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 leaves with like the, the model girlfriend, wife, and lives happily ever after. It's yeah. like, no. Yeah. You know, like if yeah. you're an ordinary person, like there's not, you know, you're not, you're just there. Yes, there are people who are like the top five percent, like the Bezos and the and like the Elon Musk's of the world. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are a lot of, most of the world, mm -hmm. most people that we meet, are, they're just ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean, just because they're ordinary, doesn't mean they have to live, you know, total mundane lives. They, they can have that moment of victory. Even that moment of victory is just as simple as like being the first person in your family to graduate with a, with a, with a degree. Yeah. Or, 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 be, or, um, or maybe you, um, you, uh, you saved the dog from the streets. You yeah. adopted the dog and it became like a big part of the family. Yeah, and yeah. that could be your redemption moment. There's, yeah. a, there's beauty in those little things. I love there's that. There's beauty in these little moments. And Steinbeck it writes stories that allows you to appreciate those people, right? Even though we forget them, we, we often forget them when we shouldn't yeah. because we're so, we're, so, we're so enraptured in our own lives. Yeah. But Steinbeck's able to write these stories that allows you to appreciate life and appreciate these ordinary people in your life. Yeah. And I think that Jocko's story is the same way. Yeah. You know, he, he, these characters that he writes, composites that he, as he says, they're just very ordinary people. But, you know, as you'll find out, if you read the book, you know, Johnny, he has this redemption moment in this book and it's, it's a really beautiful story. Yeah. I really love that. I love how you, how you contextualize it, how you label it. Uh, yeah. Pride and beauty in the mundane. That's what I heard. Yeah. That, that's really what, that, that is the beauty of John Steinbeck's writing. And, and, and I think it's important to read those stories, Fury, because it makes you, especially if you're like in this Twitterverse where it's like, it's full of like these very successful like autists where, you know, like, you know, some 18 year old making fucking 10, 15 K a month. And then you, you sort of put him out on a pestle and you're like, oh, well, this guy's a freak of nature. But at the same time, we forget we, we lose that humility we start making fun of like normies and stuff and <laughs> and we lose touch with reality yeah and i think i think that's not good i think we have to yeah. humble ourselves and remind and read these stories and like remind ourselves <laughs> that there are everyday ordinary people struggling 
every single day and they don't really achieve much, but sometimes they have these moments of redemption in their lives and it's important to recognize them. Yeah. Um, humble I, ourselves, that makes sense. It makes perfect sense because uh, yeah. I wanted to talk about this bonus material that Jocko intensely put in this book. Just like you said that, uh, what did you just say now? Everybody has these struggles, right? Something along those lines, I'm paraphrasing. And to, to tie into that, he, he said, everybody is kind of doomed. And sometimes ignorance is a little bit bliss because some people don't know that they are doomed. So he went quite philosophical in that, in that direction a little bit. But you're also doomed when you never um, have the capacity or the potentiality to feel blissful. Because if you have too much knowledge, you know, if you're too aware, right. that's the opposite of it. And that's a burden. And that's a team in the sense that everybody has a burden and you think you got problems, but you think you have problems, but so does everybody else. And right. everybody struggles. Yeah. That's part of uh, this Steinbeckian, Steinbeck-esque team, or we could call it a Jocko Willem team that he put into it, put into it very purposely. And yeah. to give a small anecdote, he was just talking, it was a tangent to uh, this type of um, team and motifs that he put in the book that he once saw when he was younger, I think also the New England time or something, there was this junkyard guy, just, I don't know, doing junkyard stuff. I don't know what you do, you know, pick up scraps and stuff like that. And he wasn't that successful, you know, he was never gonna make it, how we see like a money Twitter autism, you know? And, but this guy was happy. And he was like, there was nothing wrong with him, you know? And he was just happy going about his day. And that, that struck a chord with me. That pulled the heartstring of mine very personally when I was younger, well, I would say maybe three to four years ago, I went to um, the origin countries of my parents for uh, right. a familiar occasion. And I was in that moment, um, just graduated from university and a little bit in limbo, you could say. And in these moments, you start to scope around and try to, how do I say, tether yourself or you get tethered by these mundane things in life that humble you that, well, of course, I'm not talking don't shoot for the moon, but be grateful for the smaller things. So I went to the market. And uh, for those people listening to Fahrenheit, it was maybe 90 plus Fahrenheit, you know, 30 degrees Celsius, it's hot. And in the dead center of the market, there's this guy. And I would say like, like for a moment time froze for me. It's because I was thinking about what, what profession I'm going to chase. You know, I have this diploma, you know, I, I need to make fucking big stacks of, you know, just things piling up in my brain. Like, well, any masculine man on this masculine journey tends to have these things, at least when you're overthinking a little bit, you know? And, but I just saw this guy without a worry in the world, dead center of the market um, with these like little sticks on meat. There's a specific word in Dutch. I don't know how to call them, you know, like uh, grilled, uh, grilled sticks on the meat, you know, like skewered yeah, meat. Yeah. And he was just rotating yeah. them and like um, marinating them with like a, like a little, you know, brush. And he was just like grilling them. And it was like a small ritual act. And I was looking at that guy. He, he maybe made, you know, um, his, his rent or something, you know, by how much he sold that day. He didn't look fucking rich or successful, but in that little time bubble, that fucking time capsule, yeah. he was just there grilling meat, you know? And he, <laughs> he, was just, a, he, he was just blissfully ignorant in his yeah. time bubble. And I was like, shit, this is, you know, this is the mundane. This is the power of the mundane, you know? Yeah. And you think, you know, if I want to, I want to master something as well as this guy's mastering grilling meat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, like they always say um, in Zen Buddhism, like uh, the, the best Zen Buddhist masters are undercover on the street, you know? <laughs> they're, yeah. They're right, there. they're right fucking there. And that's yeah. the, a truth be told, not to, not to sound like a creep. Every time I go um, outside, I watch little children in the sense mm. that um, for how free they are. They have yeah. no programming. They're not stuck in the matrix. They're blissful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they're a blank page and they flow really well. So um, they don't get rejected. So I was at the square having a beer, I think, yesterday. The sun was out and I was a little bit pensive. I was just smoking there and a little bit thinking, like, what do I do now? I was overcomplicating it a little bit. And to, well, I got schooled by a Zen master who was a little five-year-old boy. <laughs> he, just, he was like running around and he was so free. It's like, shit, that kid has no care in the world. And then he, 
kind of walked by me. He made eye contact with me and I, he could see that my frequency wasn't uh, like uh, on that like power versus force high frequency, it wasn't high, you know? And he looked at me and he had like that innocent look, but high energy, you know, in his eyes. And he just waved at me really fast, you know, like, hey, what's up? And I, I waved back and it gave me like a, like, a, like a lightning bolt to my heart, you know, how he wasn't thinking about rejection, fear, anxiety. Should I wave at this guy? Should I not wave at this guy? It was uh, no mind, like they say in a Samurai Bushido wisdom, just straight off the cuff, you know? And I was like, shit, this kid has it. <laughs> you know, this kid has it. And uh, to, to tie it back a little bit that, um, yeah, the power of the mundane should be glimpsed through fiction and storytelling such as Final Spin. To, to, to yeah. Play. Yeah, because it allows you to sort of like zoom in on these otherwise on these seemingly insignificant moments. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it actually shows you this, there's some magic going on here. Yeah. Um, the, the, when you were telling me that kid, it made, it made me think of Artie, who's the, uh, one of the key characters. Oh, yeah, in the yeah. Uh, yeah, actually. Um, that, 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 that ignorance, that blissful ignorance that you yeah. described, uh, that's exactly what Artie's, Artie is. Yeah. Right, he's had this thing with, with laundry. Yeah. That's so Artie dope. is is the key character. The main character is Johnny. Artie is his little brother, and he's like as we as we mentioned at the beginning, he's mentally ill, um, and he has a job at the at a local laundromat. He's obsessed with laundry, like he knows everything about fucking laundry, like he knows which soap, what temperature, everything that that, that for, for every specific piece of clothing you have, he knows exactly how to wash it in a way that that makes it comfortable and clean and, and so forth. He's obsessed with detergents and, and softeners and lots of the stuff. Um, the guy's an alchemist when it comes to laundry. Alchemist of laundry. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you think, well, who fucking cares? It's just fucking laundry, right? But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That gets mentioned in the book as well in the beginning. But then but then it makes me think, okay, smart ass, what art form or what skill set are you that good at that yeah, yeah, good yeah, at yeah, yeah, laundry? Yeah. <laughs> right? Most most guys I know are not that good at anything, right? Yeah, yeah. Certainly yeah, yeah. not as good, you know. <laughs> Certainly not as good as Artie with laundry. The fuck yeah. are you shitting yeah. Artie? You what is your art form? What is your occupation? No, but um <laughs> I remember, so it was in the book, right? Did you read it? Like Johnny was having almost a very, actually <clears throat> Jocko is good at foreboding and for signaling doom actually, because um, at the beginning of each chapter, I think it was Johnny who was talking about how, how happy Artie was, right? Did you read that in a book? Oh yeah. So like right? in the, at the start of each chapter, yeah, it yeah. shows the thoughts yeah. of it, the thoughts of Johnny. What's going on? It was on Johnny, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's Johnny. Yeah. So how does that come up in the, in, in the order book? Can yeah, you, oh, can you, uh, is that, can you discern that? Or yeah. is that? Um, so I would say, <clears throat> um, so I'm a detective thriller writer, uh, author, <laughs> writer, I don't write those, author, uh, uh, reader. And it makes me think about the passages by the serial killer. It sounds, so hear me out. <clears throat> so the main narrative is usually the detective trying to catch the serial killer, right? And, but spliced in between, you have these like switch of uh, perspective to the serial killer. And it's usually in cursive and it's like um, just one page, almost very letter style, but he's just talking to himself, the serial killer. He's not writing this letter to uh, the detective who's trying to catch him or whatever. And so tying it back a little bit to um, Johnny. So how Jocko read it, I think it started the book out even. It was like, yeah. And it, it made me feel really creepy and full of doom, how Jocko put in. Um, so jo I would say Jocko's pretty good at voice acting. So he gave it his best that uh, it, it made me think, oh shit, something's gonna happen. You know, on page one, uh, truth be told, on page one, I already knew something was gonna happen. You know, spoiler yeah. alert in that sense, but um, yeah, it, it was cool. I like that. It, it, it gave, um, how do I say this, um, a heightened sense of propulsivity all the way from page one. I think Eddie and I talked about a little bit pre-recording that, um, so one of my favorite tricks that I learned from my favorite author is um, you make the reader hungry 
and uh, you make them hungry by making them curious. An analogy, you know, uh, to make the uh, the reader curious is to make them hungry. Right. Something's gonna happen, but you take it away from them. You know, you uh, so if you're preparing dinner, you just give them a cookie, but say, hey, steak is gonna come later. And it was cool that he did, did that with the switching perspective technique that gets used by um, New York Times bestseller thriller authors. And from here again, you can see Jocko really knows his stuff, man. That yeah, it was it was it was a smart move. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So overall, I thought it was you know it was a, it's a good book. Um, I think for a, especially for a first attempt at a novel, I mean it's good enough for me to like. Uh, if he wrote another book, I would read it again. Yeah, same. You know, but at the same time, it's not like I'm not like running out of the street and like telling my friends you have to read this book. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. So I think I, I think that's a I think that's a fair fair assessment of of, of Jocko's book. I love. I mean, I, like I said, like the, the, what what's what's gonna, what's going to happen is when you read the book, it's going to it's going to it's like a homage to life in, in a sense. Like it makes, it's going to make you grateful for what you have. Yeah. And it's going to make you feel a lot wholesome. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I would say, oh, actually, I forgot to mention that actually from like a personal angle, we can talk about that a little bit. So when I was hearing these uh, monologues by, uh, by Johnny, you know, I don't know uh, if I knew that it was Johnny in the beginning, but after like a couple of chapters, you knew. And you could tell he was having this dichotomy with Artie, you know, because Artie has this, snapped into life mundane focus but um the trade-off is that he's meant meant how do you call it he's autistic you know um, yeah so that's the trade-off but he, the, the, he's the, slow he, he's basically he's slow he's slow but the same ruminations i would say that johnny was having in that moment i tend to you know these kind of similar thoughts tend to creep up in my head sometimes as well i'm not saying it comes there on a day-to-day -day basis but it's sporadic and cyclic, cyclic, it comes back. And so I could relate quite with Johnny in that sense. You know, he was thinking like, what, what is the definition of happiness? How do, you, how, how do you become more happy, you know? And just let go of this and that. And it, you know, it, like you said, it makes you more appreciative. And yeah, I really like that from a personal point of view as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think that's a good. That's I think that's a good place to wrap up. Like in terms of like the discussion of the book itself. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything more we have to talk about. Like it's. Mm, I actually have one. Uh, I have one pretty cool thing from the bonus material. So yep. well, it's funny that we've mm, we've gone through, again very organically. We've gone through uh, almost ninety nine percent of the points that I wrote down again. You know, I just um, off the cuff of my eye, browse. But you just mentioned, nice. and we go back and forth, and that's why it flows so well. You know, so for people who want it. to get the secrets of the podcasting technique, but. Um, Mm, so <clears throat> coming back, so Jocko's editor slash agent um, is, um, how do you call it? Um, very academic. What I mean by that, he says, yo, I don't know. She went to, uh, so it's so a she, she went to some kind of. Um, I he's on the podcast. Uh, she's on the, she's on no, the. He just mentioned it. He just mentioned it. Okay. And he says uh, she has some kind of uh, Ivy League degree, you know, like very uh, prestigious, okay. you know. And she says he, she has a degree in literature. And then, uh, so coming, so tying it to uh, the uh, sequels or other books that Jocko is going to write, he's going to write a fuck ton of books, because so Jocko has almost like an affliction or a curse that when he sees a blank page, it's a gift actually if you think about it. He has too many ideas. He has an yeah. abundance of choices to write about, and the the dichotomy that gets made with his agent. So he the the the, the dilemma that was made or. Uh, showcased in front of the, the agent he asked the agent yo you went to Yale right why aren't you writing a book you know not because you know not to say not per se that he has an audience or stuff like that but he just asked her like straight up uh, have you ever thought about writing a book and then she said um yeah you know what it is when I see a blank page I don't know what to write and I wanted to so I wrote that down because I want to ask you um given the space that we're in you know our audience and our readers do you think many people have this problem that when they see a blank page, they don't know what to write, that they get some kind of form of panic, anxiety, or stress? And where do you position yourself personally when you see a blank page? Let's say you're not writing for a client, you know, and uh, you know you don't have to pay rent, you know. Yeah. You, let's say Eddie wakes up, everything's fine and good. You see a blank page. 
what goes through your mind as to the potentiality of stories that you can tell and how do you relate that to how do you see your audience in that yeah oh that's a big question dude for me like if it's just a blank page i think it always starts with an idea okay so like as soon as so normally and this is like non-business related writing like yeah, yeah. if it's like business related writing i have a process for that yeah. but if it's non-business related writing usually i'll just after a few minutes of staring at the page an idea will usually seep into my my crazy mind because i have a lot of crazy ideas yeah and i just focus in on an idea man and as soon as i, I focus on an idea it's just about a matter of getting the first sentence down it's like once i have the first sentence down the rest comes pretty easily. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But for me, it's like getting the idea and getting the first sentence down is the mm. hardest part. Okay. Mm. I, I know you a little bit. So this is a little bit like, uh, how do you call it? Like a little peek behind the curtain, you know? But you've mentioned that you came into the smartphone world a little bit late. Do you think yeah. there's a causality even or a relationship to? The, the Zoomers having smartphone too fast that hampers their uh, imaginative receptors, that they're incapable yeah. of crafting stories versus contrastly to you and I, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Bro, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time and I've mm -hmm. struggled to put in the words. Yeah. But I think, I think what's happening now, and someone else wrote about this today. I think it, I think it was, I can't remember who it was. Some, it was oh. some other Twitter bro who wrote about it. Yeah. But but um what's happening now is like people are scared of being bored yeah okay because they're just constantly stipulating because yeah. they're not used to creating thoughts and completing thoughts okay so the comp to complete a thought is actually a process it mm -hmm. starts with an idea and it, and it takes time for your brain to sort of think about it and arrive at the conclusion mm -hmm. and that all happens it all happens at subconsciously mm -hmm. and we don't really recognize it because we're just cute we're just a bunch of like monkeys walking around in the yeah. suit yeah and we just do this <laughs> automatically we just we just we do this thing automatically yeah but what's happening now is that people don't have the patience or the inclination to complete that thought they look to their phone for thoughts and so now instead of like just Th that that process of thinking and fulfilling a, and completing a thought they categorize as i'm bored I'm, yes that's boring yes so instead and to and, and it's, a, it's a void it's a very uncomfortable void for them mm -hmm. because they're not used to feeling it and so yep. instead of instead of like writing it down mm -hmm. or thinking about it or reflecting upon it they grab your phone and then they yeah. distract themselves and, and watch some TikTok video or whatever. And then before they know it, that thought is gone. They, they're distracted by whatever advertiser wants them to watch. Yeah. And, and more creepily, more toxic, more dangerous, what an advertiser wants you to think. Not what God, yes. not what the universe, the void, your, your soul, your spirit, your, your muse. Exactly. Your instinct, you your muse, God, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right, brother. And it's creepy it's, as it's, fuck. It, 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 it's it, it's it's yeah. scary, man. It's, it's spooky scary as hell. Yeah. <laughs> like people, people, and what's what's even like? What's even worse is yeah, you have all these people who are like talking about, you know, the singularity is coming, AI is going to take over and shit. Okay. Well, the way you rebel against that is just to fucking put it aside and trust your God-given ability to think and to come up with ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and the, well, but the thing is that is a slow process. It's a yeah. very slow process. Yeah. And because of how powerful and how fast your phone is, people are not willing to to accept that boredom. Yes. To think. Yeah. It it makes a little segue, you know. See the potentiality of the mundane, you know. Yeah. And I, and I think that's why Twitter is such a unique platform because Twitter is like that one space in the digital world where people are still sharing very interesting ideas mm -hmm. and putting out their thoughts. Yeah. But even yeah. with Twitter, it's like, I've noticed myself, I was talking to a friend about this today. Mm -hmm. 
about how when you spend too much time on Twitter, for me anyway, like my thought, I'm not getting organic thoughts. I'm just reading other tweets and like trying to like play the engagement game. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting these ideas. I'm not getting these novel thoughts. And that's frustrating to me as a creator. And so I have to like, so that, that's when I have to say, I talk about, I have Twitter burnout. That's what I mean by that. It's like, I'm not having that organic experience yes, yes. of okay. having, of, of, of just, you know, of just listening to my intu- in, intuition or God, or what you want to call it, and, and yeah. going along with that. Yeah. No, I feel you on that. Uh, it's actually nice that uh, what my memory just popped up in my head that was on the list of questions I was going to ask you last time on Twitter yeah. burnout. I wrote that down. Yeah. It's good that you tackled it now this time. But yeah. um, I feel you. I have the same. Uh, that's why I try to switch it up how I approach Twitter. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I sell lighters. I'll, I'll sell merchandise. Uh, I do coaching. Uh, I just spar in the DMs with people, just catch up. Um, just try to get them on Telegram, you know? Um, I try to meet up with Twitter bros. I switch it up just for the sake of creating a new segue, a new space to breach it open, not to make it Monday, not to make it bored in the sense that uh, that I get stuck, you know? Not bo- that bored is bad in this case, but to switch it up for my, for my brain, you know? Because I have hedonistic adaption, adaptation, how they call it in psychology. And... Um, yeah, man. So I have the same thing with being bored. You know, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I'm drinking coffee right now. I'm smoking full on nicotine. You know, and the nicotine gets in my system. And I'm one of those persons as well. But I try to catch myself in the act. So when I'm feeling a certain way, even when I'm bored, I uh, rephrase it or reframe it in my journal as you. I think Fury, you're in withdrawal of. I have six things. It's always six things. It's either a withdrawal or an overstimulation of these six things after which withdrawal comes. What I mean by that, let's say I booze or I smoke, or uh, let's say you see women or you uh, eat too much sugar or too much ca- uh, caffeine. So I have this list of almost six things and I write them okay. down constantly because after or before that, there's this weird feeling in my head that just wants more or less of these, uh, of these six things. And it's, it's not even bored. It's, how do I say this? It's blunting of the receptors, I call it. If you have these little pumps in your head, it's, shit, I ate too much sugar today. I want more, more, more. Uh, I ate too little sugar. Now I'm like getting hangry, you know? Or, you know, uh, I had too much sex. Now I want more. Or I had too little sex. Now it's, it's this little monkey, like you said, running around in this meat suit, you know? La, la, la. So yeah. I, I, I get that we're all human and I try to catch myself in the act by by journaling on it or talking to people about you about this that that were aware of it and yeah and they, uh, god you know uh, uh, you know like thank god that in the creative pro- process you know that i'm when i see a blank page i'm at least not hampered to not create output you know with right. tweet for sake of engagement i sometimes have that you know uh, honest to god truth but when i just want to write something that nobody's gonna ever see the daylight of I, I thank God that, that I have that, you know, like muse on me, you know, I can just, you know, I can just like, you know, it's like playing music for me, you know, like I, I tend to sometimes play music as well, but you know, I have nothing stopping me when I see the blank page and that gives a little bit of solace, I would say, you know, a little safe haven. Yeah. 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 That, that's a good part to, to, because my stock is almost done. It's, it's the perfect time. <laughs> yeah. Bro, every time I talk to you, like I have this like, incredible energy like i want to go write something now yeah um no, i had a fuck to, i have a fuck ton of energy for people listening on this the, the <laughs> detective slash serial killer uh, action hero book is gonna come <laughs> oh bro bro i'm i'm the same way i'm gonna i'm gonna write detective novel at some point in my life yeah man maybe this year we'll see what happens cool as fuck uh but it's funny man like before you, you uh just people don't know like this is like we've been planning this for a few weeks and like just due to scheduling errors, we haven't had the time to plan a good time. That's good for both of us. And then you just randomly shot me a message today. So you caught me a little off guard. Yeah. And I will confess my energy was a little bit low, but as soon as we started talking, I was just like, yeah, let's do this. To, <laughs> to, to, to make it full circle. Yeah. That, um, I was thinking again, overthinking too much in terms of output, you know? 
to yeah. put those moon shots that you want to achieve yes. in life. And not say that I was burned out, but I was a little, uh, I think to, to categorize, I was low energy as well. But then I thought, you know, uh, I had promised Eddie to talk about final spin and this uh, acceptance of the mundane, not to say that this was mundane, but to tie it nicely back. It, yeah. It was just to give it a chance to just for the sake of the mundane to just be wholesome, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I love it, man. That, that's a great conclusion to a, to a fantastic yeah. chat. Yeah, now, we got to do this again, man. We got we to pick it up and go, go right into it. Yeah, we can uh, next time. So uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in on the Eddie Fury podcast, special edition. Um, once again, uh, we're going to do this more often, I feel, you know, because me and Eddie have yeah. lots to talk about. Uh, I, I, I yeah. think I said in a break or something, maybe I'll go to Colombia or he's going to come to Euroland here, Europe, you know. So uh, definitely that's in the works. Uh, next time, maybe we can talk about Norwegian wood you know yeah um, and that'll be interesting chat i have uh, what i can do is because i haven't read that book for about 10 years yeah whereas you read it pretty recently yeah i, I finished um, it this week what maybe may, maybe i can read like a plot summary just to refresh my memory sure um and then we can talk about it yeah for uh, you know for people who want to know next time on the eddie fury and uh, a podcast and but uh, so we, that- we should do we should do a movie review at some point as well yeah, so we talked about it as well. Uh, I yeah. haven't watched movies recently, so it's going to be a classic or something like that, you know, from the old days. Sure, definitely. So, yeah, we can talk about that. And Green Lights, we've uh, had an affinity for oh, Green Lights. We, we, could talk- do, we, could do that. we could do that one next if you want. Yeah. Because we, we can, both no, read that one. Yeah, we can do that one definitely. Like, let's do that one, like, uh, next time. And then after that, maybe Norwegian Wood. Because yeah, Green right, Lights... Um, oh, Green Lights was the first audible autobiography that I listened to. Yeah. Because I wanted to hear McConaughey's voice. His, his yeah, voice. he's such a good actor. It's he's cool. such a good actor. The, the parts where he's talking about like his mom and dad fighting, like it's just so it's so <laughs> visual. It's so well done. Like yeah. you can imagine, like you can just yeah. picture like, yourself hanging out with his parents. Yeah. As you as you're <laughs> listening to him tell the stories. I, I quote his mom some. Uh, actually, so there's an irony. Uh, I don't quote slash quote his mom because his mom had so a small little segue. Um, Matthew McConaughey had to win a poem contest. So her mom whips up a poem. Uh, she makes him copy the poem to a page. And then she says, you're going to turn that in for the competition or for the, for the test or something. But he says, that's not mine. Then she said, uh, you, you just wrote it, right? Yes. You understood it, right? Yes. Now it's yours. <laughs> yeah. So every time uh, somebody has something that they're like, afraid of plagiarism or something like that i quote yeah matthew mcconaughey's mom or i don't quote her you know because it's my yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah, yeah. So dude that's a funny ass book I'm, I'm looking forward to that conversation yeah, so for everybody uh for fans of matthew mcconaughey uh his acting work and his vitality and his you know his sauce so stay tuned for that and uh lots of things to come uh thanks for tuning in so uh stay frosty Hua. Hua. cheers